Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Oncology Research and Care, Reimagining Digital Innovation. My name is Ryan Muse and I'll be your X Talks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and this presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. Now, the webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit your questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box. And we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel, which is on the right hand side of your screen. And if you require any assistance along the way, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this same chat panel. At this time, know that all participants are in listen only mode. And please note that the event will be recorded and made available for streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank Actigraph and VivoSense who developed the content for this presentation. Actigraph's mission is to bring life to digital data. Built on more than 20 years of remote data capture expertise, Actigraph is the leading provider of medical grade wearable motion sensors for the global scientific community. Actigraph's FDA cleared biosensors and flexible technology ecosystem deliver high quality continuous digital data, providing valuable insights into the real world behaviors of clinical trial participants. And VivoSense is an agile end-to-end -end solutions company measuring patient outcomes by developing novel digital endpoints from wearable sensor data focused on healthcare research and delivery, clinical trials, and patient wellness. Now I would like to introduce our speakers for today's event. From Actigraph Chief Executive Officer Jeremy Wyatt, from VivoSense Chief Science Officer Kate Leiden, we also have Ariel Aguilo, Executive Medical Director from LabCorp Drug Development, George Deva, uh, Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine, Keck School of Medicine, and Heather Jim, Senior Member and Co-Leader of the Health Outcomes and Behavior Program from the Moffitt Cancer Center. And so now, without further ado, I'd like to hand the mic over to our first speaker, Jeremy Wyatt. You may begin when you're ready. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks to everybody that joined today. I uh, really appreciate you taking some time to, uh, to hang out with us whether it's morning or afternoon for you we know your time is very valuable um uh, we decided to uh, actigraph and vo sense to partner together on this webinar and, and and give you guys our perspective on oncology research and care uh with with a, with a lens on digital innovation and i know that's a very popular topic today proud to do this with vivo sense we very much value the partnership we have with that team and kate and i have a long history of working together and uh we very, really value vivo sense's uh, expertise in um, not only you know, protocol development, uh, but also on the on the analytics side of, of how you measure digital endpoints and and really how you add value into these different therapeutic areas. And I think that Actigraph and VivoSense do it better together than anyone on the planet. And so I'm a little biased, but very proud to be here with them. Next slide, please. Um, real quick about Actigraph. You know, we've been doing this for a long time, about 20 years. A lot of involvement in large multi-site studies uh, started our life in academia and moved that into clinical trials. And I think one value that we bring together here is that uh, we believe deeply in the academic value uh, that we've not yet seen realized in the clinical trial world. And so we try to bring some of that transparency and some of that validation into the clinical trial world to give uh, you know to support the evidence that we that we provide. Um, our hardware and software systems are of course all uh, validated. Our hardware being five ten. K class two cleared and uh, hardware, other hardware being class one cleared. And then our quality management system here is of course, uh, where, where it needs to be ISO 1345, which mirrors FDA CFR 21 compliance. So uh, so we've been doing this a long time. Next slide, um, real, real brief, our history. We were founded in 2004, we've got great uh, experience in academia. Uh, on the right side, clinical trials, uh, as, we, as we grow and learn and doing this, uh, Actigraph's been involved in about, a uh, little outdated here, about 200 uh, clinical trials we've been involved in and uh, some proven track record of delivering digital biomarkers and evidence to support clinical claims. I think there's a lot of opportunity in oncology and you're going to hear from some experts today and how do we get to a place where we can really deliver on quality of life information and data, objective data, uh, for these studies that have historically relied on subjective measures of quality of life. And so uh, next slide, we can actually skip the next slide. I want to hand it over to Kate Lydon, uh, who is really going to talk a, a little bit more about uh, what we're going to what we're going to get into today. Before we do, just a quick survey, if we can pull this poll up. Uh, Ryan, this is just a quick question to get folks engaged. What is your primary industry? We want to know where you're from and what you're uh, what you're doing today. That'll help us a little bit 
uh, get dialed in on on how to deliver the message and, and what types of questions uh, we can we can ask the team here today. So we'll give you just a second, and Ryan, I'll defer to you when the uh, uh, when the survey is complete. Yep, it looks like actually the majority of people have voted. So I'll take a look now at our results here on the screen for you. Very helpful, very helpful. So as, as our team today uh, begins to to discuss uh, our perspective on digital endpoints and oncology, that'll be helpful to think through involvement of these different industries, in particular majority of pharma folks on the call. Kate, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Jeremy, and thanks, Ryan. Jeremy, I think that's the fastest I've ever seen you go through slides, so I can tell how excited you are to actually get to this content um, today. So as Jeremy said, I am Kate Leiden, the Chief Science Officer at VivoSense, um, where we combine science and technology to develop, validate, and implement real-world digital clinical measures. So I'm really excited to be here today, and thanks again for all the folks joining on the line. Um, before I turn it over to our great speakers, who I'm super excited to hear from, I wanted to take just a brief moment and expand a little bit on what Jeremy said and also set the stage for what I anticipate will be a great discussion that will follow the three um, speakers that we have today. So next slide, please, Ryan. So first, a few statistics. I'm going to start with the good. Um, we've seen tremendous progress in the fight against cancer in recent years. In the top left, I'm showing the decline in death rate from cancers um, from the early 1990s until present day. And this is close to 30%, with upwards of 73% of these survival gains being attributed to advances in treatment. And then if we look to the top right, this is reflected in the number of cancer survivors. Um, as we've seen, it's increased from roughly 3 million in 1971 to almost 17 million in 2019 and projected to be more than 25 million um, by 2040, with a 41% um, increase in the five-year survival rate from the 1970s until 2014. Um, but it's not, it's not all good news. Cancer remains the second leading cause of death, accounting for roughly 21% of deaths in the United States among, among Americans. And the clinical trial success rate for uh, cancer trials is quite low at 3.4%. Um, and this is, this is quite low compared to other uh, therapeutic areas. So there is um, you know, reason to be excited for the progress in recent years in the, the rate of discovery. Um, but there's significant room for improvement in both the clinical care models um, that cancer patients and caregivers um, have to uh, go through for you know long decades of their life, as well as the drug development process. So next slide, please, Ryan. So are there opportunities for real-world digital clinical measures to help move the needle in the oncology space? And clearly, I'm biased, but but yes, of course there is. Um, this slide's not meant to be an exhaustive representation of the opportunities that, that we have in this space, but rather a high-level summary of the specific areas that I'm particularly excited about. Um, Real-world digital clinical measures and wearables and remote monitoring technologies, they offer us the ability to collect data passively, remotely, and continuously for days, weeks, um, months, even years. Um, in, a, in a patient's real-world environment. They allow us to capture the patient's, patient's true lived experience. Um, of course, overall uh, survival has been the endpoint that most cancer medicines have been approved um, in, in the past, but regulatory authorities are increasingly open to new approaches um, and perhaps the most immediate opportunity for digital clinical measures in this space is how do, how do we expand on this quality of life measure that Jeremy um, had mentioned? This is so important to patients going through cancer treatment. How do, how do we um, better make sure that cancer treatments are you know, not only um, expanding or extending life, but also um, adding quality time to that patient's life? And then in the post-market, um, is there an opportunity to conduct pharmacovigilance and pharmacoepidemiology with these types of wearable sensors and digital clinical measures? If we develop a robust 
you know, solution to objectively detect and report adverse drug responses um, in the post-market. Might we see more cancer drugs be granted accelerated approval with the idea that they can move to the post-market for confirming that approval or even expanding those approvals? Targeted therapies. The majority of you know cancer medications that have been approved in recent years have been targeted therapies and the majority of cancer medications that are in the pipeline are also targeted therapies meaning that they're based on genotypes but can we use these sorts of tools to collect data in the real world um, and really add to this by including important information about potentially physical behavior phenotype or other physiological measures that might be important and then last, but definitely not least, um, is treatment management and optimization. We now have the technology to measure the side effects of cancer medications, which by design are toxic in nature. Um, and so the side effects that patients experience can be vast and debilitating. Can we use data collected on a daily basis to really optimize and improve outcomes and also minimize the side effects that patients have to endure. Next slide, please, Ryan. And so talking about these opportunities and the potential that we have um, before us is a lot easier than actually doing this work. And in healthcare and the drug development space, oncology um, and the cancer communities have been slower to adopt digital clinical measures than other therapeutic areas. Um, the Digital Medicine Society's crowdsource library of digital endpoints, um, I believe now has uh, more than 200 catalog um, endpoints um, that our industry colleagues have registered, but only one of those that I'm aware of is in a trial that's related um, to cancer. But conversely, I would argue that in the non-drug development clinical research space, as well as cancer epidemiology, these sorts of tools and measures are actually being used quite substantially. Um, so I think it's important as we go through today's webinar to sort of keep in mind this question of how do we bridge the gaps between the work that's being done in the academic clinical space, as well as in public health, how do we build an infrastructure that more seamlessly integrates the findings from these spaces um, into drug development and clinical care for our industry colleagues? And then I think the second thing to keep in mind as we go through this webinar is that it's still early days for digital clinical measures across the board. Um, but again, in the Digital Medicine Society's um, digital endpoint library, very few of the registered endpoints are exploratory endpoints. I think that if we um, want to accelerate the, the process, the progress in this area, um, and really get the cancer communities to adopt these sorts of measures and tools in their research and care, we need to sort of take a step back and think about how do we develop these measures robustly from the ground up. And it's my opinion that this, this looks like, what this looks like is including these endpoints as exploratory measures in earlier phase trials. This is the most efficient way to build the clinical validity evidence base that's gonna be needed to take these endpoints on to primary and secondary um, endpoints in later phase trials. So with that, I um, will send it back to Ryan to put up our next poll question before I pass it on to our three speakers. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Uh, for our next poll question, the question we're asking is, what topics are important to you today? Your answer options are operational challenges of leveraging wearables for oncology studies, executive buy-in for technology and clinical trials, resources and initiatives supporting digital endpoints in clinical studies, example use cases of applications of digital technologies in clinical trials or patient centricity. Please uh, take a moment to select one of the answers you see in front of you and then click submit in order to participate. We'll give you a few more seconds to get an answer in. We greatly appreciate you taking the time to do so. There we are, we look like we have the majority of people. Let's take a look at our results. Um, very interesting from everyone. Thank you very much for your participation. Uh, now, I believe we'll be handing it over to our next speaker today, Heather Jim. 
Yep, thanks, Ryan. So um, Heather is going to be our first speaker today. Um, Dr. Heather Jim is a senior member and co-leader of the Health Outcomes and Behavior Program at the Moffitt Cancer Center. So Heather, we're really excited to have you and I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Can can everyone see and hear me and see my slides okay? We got you over here, Heather. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm really excited about the opportunity to be here today. Um, and thanks to Kate and Jeremy um, for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm going to be talking about some um, preliminary and provocative data that we've been collecting here at uh, Moffitt Cancer Center focused on circadian rhythms in cancer patients and how those relate to clinical outcomes. And the goal here is really kind of to sort of get people thinking about the art of what's possible with digital data collection. <clears throat> um, so first, let me talk a little bit about uh, circadian rhythms. Um, and so you can measure those um, non-invasively um, in patients using a wrist-worn accelerometer, um, like the one shown here. And uh, you see these graphs here at the bottom. These are the kind of data that you get. And um, these show um, physical activity that's identified by the black bars here over a 24-hour cycle from noon one day to noon the next. Uh, this light blue area shows um, where the patient has said that they were in bed at night sleeping. And the red indicates um, when the actigraph is scoring um, when they're awake versus the white is sleep. And so this um, top graph is taken from a patient with gynecologic cancer before the start of chemotherapy. And you can see sort of this nice, smooth, almost kind of sine wave of activity that's high during the day, and then it dips down low at night. Um, you can see a little bit of activity here. Maybe she's tossing and turning and then back um, up again um, in high activity during the day. And in contrast, this is the same patient um, after starting chemotherapy. And now you can see that that sine wave is flattened, that she has um, much less um, circadian rhythmicity than she did before. So she's less active during the day, maybe resting or taking naps here and here, um, and then awake a lot at night. And so we think that circadian rhythmicity uh, is important in cancer. Um, and we think this for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, um, there are variants um, in circadian uh, genes that are associated with cancer onset. Um, for example, um, this is a study that we did on the right here. Um, in over uh, 50,000 ovarian cancer patients and controls, showing that uh, a variant in the BMAL gene was associated with um, ovarian cancer. And um, there's also data um, from the International Agency for Research on Cancer um, saying that night shift work is probably carcinogenic and they base this evaluation on mechanistic studies in animals and also um, uh, epi, um, epidemiologic studies in humans. Although it's a little bit hard to know the direction because perhaps people who already have circadian disruption may be drawn to shift work. Um, but then also specifically in cancer, we know that cells replicate in a circadian pattern, um, but cancer cells become very disrupted and they lose that circadian pattern. And we know that cells of our body communicate up um, to the brain um, to set the circadian pattern of behavior in the organism. So, Lots of converging lines of evidence here that that may be important. Um, so we did a study of patients with gynecologic cancer or suspected gynecologic cancer, I should say. This was 115 patients and we collected um, patient reported outcomes from them. We had them wear an actigraph for a week before their diagnostic surgery. So at the time we recruited them and at the time that they were the actigraph completed the questionnaires, they didn't know whether they had cancer or not. Nobody knew. Um, they just knew that they had a suspected um, uh, gynecologic mass that was suspicious for cancer. And so we found some really interesting uh, results. So this was in 86 patients 
And we found that those who had um, better overall rhythmicity were more likely to go on to receive a benign diagnosis. And those who went on um, to receive a malignant diagnosis showed um, greater uh, circadian disruptions. And what was interesting about this study was that there were no differences in the groups uh, regarding uh, patient reported symptoms of gynecologic cancer. So it seems like uh, the behavior might be measuring something different than the symptoms. Um, and then the second provocative uh, study that I'll talk about is a study of uh, 45 patients treated with blood and marrow transplantation. And again, we had them um, wear an actigraph, in this case, before they had their transplant. And then uh, we collected patient reported quality of life at one month, three months, and six months post transplant. And we found this really interesting pattern of results where sort of people who you might consider early birds, um, the ones who get up early in the morning, as shown here by Up Macer, um, not only had better quality of life before transplant, um, but they also had faster recovery of quality of life after transplant as well. So the early birds are shown here kind of in the navy and the night owls are shown here in the light blue where these are the folks who are getting up later in the morning. And so at first you could think, well, maybe circadian rhythm is kind of a proxy for quality of life, um, but actually that wasn't the case. So down measure indicates sort of when people are sort of winding down at the end of the day um, and you can see here that the groups um, had no differences at quality of life and baseline. But again, you see these early birds shown here in Navy have faster recovery of quality of life um, than the night owl. So it suggests that not only maybe is activity important, but the timing of activity may be important as well for reasons that we don't quite understand. And then um, the third and last study that I'll just mention briefly is a study of 72 patients with lung cancer who had treated with immunotherapy. And we were really intrigued by this idea that perhaps patient reported outcomes could be used to identify when a patient was progressing on treatment. And so we have an integrated mathematical oncology department here at Moffitt, and they specialize in modeling change in tumor growth over time. And so they analyzed this data for us. And what they found was that of all the patient reported outcomes that we asked about, and we asked many, um, it was sleep that the one, was the one that seemed to be most consistent with when um, a tumor was um, growing or shrinking. So these are um, some nice uh, example graphs from three of the patients on the study. And the tumor volume is shown here over time um, in this patient growing in black. And then the increase in uh, insomnia is shown sort of overlaid with that. So you see insomnia increasing as the tumor in, um, grows and decreasing um, as the tumor shrinks on treatment. So um, there's some really, I think, interesting uh, conclusions to be drawn here. Again, I wanna qualify the data um, are preliminary. So, you know, we need to see whether these data will be replicated in larger samples. Um, but it's interesting because it seems like behavior may map on to the biology of cancer to some extent. And um, to get at the idea earlier of sort of these of phenotypes, it may be possible to use behavior as kind of a non-invasive biomarker of quality of life and disease outcomes. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop and take any questions that folks have. Yeah, this is Jeremy. I'm just curious, did you have any pushback from uh, patients on, on wearing the technology or, or kind of where do they land on that? Yeah, so um, most of them were fine with it, um, actually. I think that, so we've been using actigraphy for a long time. We started in 2007 and, you know, at first it was sort of novel because people didn't wear smartwatches. Um, and so there were more concerns. Now that it's sort of more commonplace to see people wearing something similar, I think it's become more acceptable for the patients. Thanks.
Yeah, Jeremy, you beat me to that question. I mean, Heather, you were recruiting patients at a time that was obviously very sensitive for them, especially in the first study where they're about to find out if they actually have cancer or they don't. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting that you were still able to recruit patients to do this, to add this piece of technology to their life. So very interesting work. Um, thank you so much. So I think we're going to hand it over to our next speaker who will be um, George Nieva. Um, George is the section head of Solid Tumors Division of Medical Oncology at the Keck School of Medicine and director of the Lung um, Cancer Research Program within the USC Norris Cancer Center. So George, thank you very much for being here today and I will pass it over to you. Thanks so much, Kate, for the opportunity to speak today to this group. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about performance status. Um, so let's begin with my disclosures. And then we can talk a little bit about David Karnofsky, who developed the performance status scales in um, you know, the 1950s. Uh, if we could show that on the next slide, we can see the performance status scales. You can see that there's 10 divisions in uh, Dr. Karnofsky's original um, uh, scale. And that was hard for a lot of people, so we then came up with the ECOG performance status scale on the next slide, which really uh, only had five divisions and divided people up between normal uh, all the way down to bedridden. And you can see that for people with lung cancer, it has tremendous effects on their overall survival, with the good performance status patients doing great and the poor performance status patients doing poorly. Um, and this really isn't very surprising, right? I mean, we sick people are sick, and not sick people are not sick. This is not a, a so something that's so groundbreaking. Uh, next slide. But what, what I think is underappreciated is just how important it is. So here you see the breakdown. Uh, the, the two curves on the left are the differences in survival curves according to performance status for stage three and stage four lung cancer patients. And you can see, wow, those are pretty wide separations on the curve. You know, how meaningful is that? And, and so the curve in the upper right next to the Nobel Prize is immunotherapy and the effect it has on patient survival in lung cancer. And the slide immediate, and the graph immediately below that in the lower right, that's the effect targeted therapy use has in lung cancer. So really the, the effects of performance status really are larger than the effects of really our best and most fundamental therapeutics in lung cancer. Next slide. So really the, the question for a lot of folks is, which lung cancer patient are you really dealing with? Um, are you dealing with the patient on the top or are you dealing with the patient on the bottom? And you can imagine that it, it has tremendous effects uh, on patient outcomes. So when you look at you know, some very old clinical trials, ECOG 1594, we say, yeah, there was not a big difference in terms of outcome uh, among the four different chemotherapies that were uh, commonly used at the time. You can see that performance status effect on median survival uh, was really enormous. And you say, well, you know, yeah, Dr. Nieva, but this is the molecular era. We don't, we don't get into these simple things like performance status anymore. Well, you know, when you look at TCGA, the only gene that actually made a difference in terms of survival in lung cancer, well, it wasn't any of the genes. The significant predictors were stage and margin status at time of resection for people uh, with early stage lung cancer in the TCGA. Smoke, um, people who were non-smokers, -sm uh, genomics, gender, none of these things were as important as stage and margin status of resection. Um, but really, performance status, that's actually really where the big differentiator comes. Next slide. Now, this has been looked at before in the uh, North Central Cancer Treatment Group when it still existed. Um, and shows you the problems with performance status in terms of getting agreement between the physician and the patient. Uh, and the problem that we have is that when the physicians and patients agree, it's actually not that common. It happens less than 50% of the time. Some of the times the physicians assign patients performance status three categories higher on the ECOG scale than what the patients would assign themselves. So that's like the difference between saying, yeah, I'm normal and I'm close to bedridden. Um, but if the physician and patient agree, the patient outcomes are better. How much better? About 16% better if there's agreement in those fewer than 50% of the cases where there is agreement. And you say 16%, is that a big deal? Well, on the next slide, you'll see that it's a much of a big deal 
as adjuvant therapy with cisplatin in lung cancer. These are very similar um, magnitudes of effect. Next slide. And you say, Dr. Nieva, the NCTTG, that's a big multi-center trial. I can understand how there'd be problems with discordance and performance status. I'll be honest with you, we can't even do it very well at USC. This is our single institution trial and we get correlations between uh, physician coordinator and patient assigned performance status, you know, with coefficients of, of uh, correlation anywhere from 0.25 to 0.48. Uh, next slide. So we, we do uh, clinical trials here and we use a couple of different technologies. We use wearables, but we also use video gaming technology. We use uh, the Xbox Connect. It's a video gaming platform that lets you see the patient in the room, see the articulations on the skeleton. And we do something very simple. We ask them to get on the exam table, which if you talk to oncologists, they'll tell you that's how they evaluate performance status, right? They're not sending the patients out to do get up and go tests. They're not having the patients complete PROs. They say, oh, I just kind of watch them get on the exam table and then I decide what they're doing. So we said, well, let's, let's make that objective. And then let's use some wearables and see if it's right. Next slide. So this is what um, our activity data look like. So we, we really focus for purposes of our trials You'll notice that some people stay in bed kind of, you know, longer into the day. So we, we decided, you know, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, that's when, you know, everyone's supposed to be out of bed. So we really focused on that time frame. Next slide. And we didn't use steps as our measurement. We used metabolic equivalence. And the, the nice thing about metabolic equivalence is that it's it's standardized and it's accepted, right? There's, a, there's reams of physiology papers that discuss um, met cutoffs, um, and anything that's a met above 1.5 is physical activity. Anything below 1.5, that's, that's stationary behavior. And, and for our cancer patients, we're not really looking at who's the marathon runner. We're looking at, you know, who's vacuuming the carpet. Next slide. So the data sets are fairly noisy to look at. This is a, an example of two patients, one who's not very active in the blue and one who is very active in the orange. And you say, well, how do you, how do you quantify that? How do you, how do you make that into something sensible? And on the next slide, you'll see that all we really do is basically cut it off at 1.5, and then we basically count uh, the amount of time that patients uh, stay above the curve, and that way we, we can tell who's being active and who's not. Next slide. So you say, okay, well, now you know who's active, and now you know who's not active. How do you know really who's doing well and who's not doing well? For our initial clinical trial, we looked across all tumor types. So we didn't want to use things like overall survival because we know that that would be highly variable. We really are trying to assess frailty. So how did we assess frailty? We looked at unexpected healthcare encounters. How many times did these patients get hospitalized, show up at the ER, go to the infusion center, or have doctor's visits that weren't scheduled? Um, now, a lot of people just like to focus on ER visits. The truth is, I'm an oncologist. We don't use the ER. We bring the patient into our infusion room and we do treatments there and we kind of act like an ER for our patients. So you got to count those when you're uh, measuring uh, the effect of these uh, interventions. Next slide. So this is, um, this is what our data really looked like. Um, what you see here are patients categorized into the four uh, broken columns or five broken columns here of people who were uh, not very active, active for less than five total hours in a 60-day period, to people who are very active, active for more than 40 hours. Now, that's very active. That's just, that's like still just a little active. That's not like running marathons or anything. That's just saying that basically they spent, you know, more, you know, close to an hour a day where they were up and about doing stuff. And what you see here is how many unexpected healthcare encounters they had, and it's color-coded by what type of encounter it was, uh, and what you see here is that basically the more active you are, the fewer problems you have. Next slide. Now, the first slide I showed you in this talk was my disclosure slide. It was to let you know that I have biases. Well, clinicians who enroll in clinical trials, they have biases too. They like to get their patients exciting new drugs. They like to be credited with clinical trial accruals. They like to get the payments to their institution. They like to not have to hassle with insurance companies. So, how can we make this objective and get rid of those biases in terms of how physicians assign performance status? Next slide. So we like to use uh, the Xbox Connect, as I mentioned, and this is available now in newer iterations uh, where we watch people move. So on the next slide, we'll watch people move. 
So how do you tell if somebody is an active person or not? Well, you could just watch them get on the exam table. And what you can see here is uh, what um, an active person and a not active person look like when they get on the exam table. You can look at this and it's de-identified, right? So there's no problems here with, with knowing um, the patient's identity. Um, and you can see that the fit person does this movement very quickly and the not so fit person uh, really kind of, you know, gets on the exam table slowly and kind of, you know, does it in a way that doesn't have a lot of acceleration. Uh, and so we can objectify rather than subjectify the performance status measurement. Next slide. So, you know, you can graph all that out. This is something we did at the South by South Lawn uh, uh, conference a couple of years ago as part of the uh, Cancer Moonshot program that uh, Vice President Biden at the time had set up. Next slide. And, and what you can see is that as people are moving onto the exam table, if you quantify acceleration, uh, let's go forward. I think we went back here a second. Uh, as, as if you quantify acceleration, you can figure out who's going to have an unexpected healthcare encounter and who's not. That's the, the graphics here at the bottom, UHV. Um, and the people who are going to have unexpected healthcare encounters, uh, they're going to be more likely to um, move slower, accelerate slower. Uh, and we can quantify that. Next slide. So we're doing this uh, in a clinical trial of all the phase one patients enrolling into studies at USC. This, uh, this is ongoing. We call this the Precision PS study. And we're gonna now move from unexpected healthcare encounters as the measurement to the things that the folks in pharma really care about, DLTs, SAEs, um, and uh, time on trial. Um, next slide. But we also have a pandemic that we're dealing with. So we wanna be able to do everything by telemedicine as well. We're uh, doing a remote clinical trial uh, with a, a pharmaceutical partner uh, that will likely launch first quarter next year, where the patients are gonna be seen entirely by telemedicine. And we're gonna use these tools to try to um, uh, measure their performance and basically work as a substitute for a physical examination while people get what was formerly an intravenous drug in a subcutaneous fashion at home. Next slide. Of course, all this for telemedicine requires a physician dashboard so that when we're assessing the patient, we can see their quality of life scores, we can see their outcomes on the pro CTCAE scale and their vital signs. And, uh, and then we can just go ahead and go on to the end because I'm probably running out of time here. Um, you know, it takes a lot of teamwork to make this done, but really the fundamental thing that we're doing is we're comparing the patient versus the tumor and how much of the outcome is dependent on the patient and how much is dependent on the tumor. And that's really what these tools are designed to measure. So with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. And I'd be happy to take any uh, questions from the audience. Great, thanks, George. Um, as we move on to the next speaker, I just wanted to um, ask Ariel and Heather if you quickly have a question for Dr. Nieva. Thank you, I, I was really curious. It was cool to see the um, videos of the person kind of getting up from the chair compared to their performance status. Have you looked at how well that correlates with the self-reported performance status? Because I'm wondering if you wanted to scale that up at, my, if it correlates well with how if with people with what people are saying, then maybe it's easier just to ask them. Um, it 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 correlates to some degree with the patient reported performance status. I, I think the challenge is that um, you know the agreement's not perfect, and it's not always reproducible. And also the collection of the patient reported uh, performance status oftentimes will sort of get filtered with the physician's opinion. And, and so we wanted some way of really making it truly objective. Great, thanks, George. Um, we'll move on to our next speaker, um, Ariel Aguelo. He is a board certified oncologist. He is the executive medical director and head of the America's Oncology Medical Team for LabCorp Drug Development. So Ariel, over to you. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for the invitation for today's webinar. So definitely, I'm not presenting data 
in terms of trials that I try to do, it's it's more kind of understanding uh, or letting you know why I now uh, fully support the idea that digital measures in oncology is an unmet need. And I hope that after my presentation, we will all agree that that is the statement that we should be following for sure. So my history, it's about, I think, can you see my slide? I'm sorry. That's okay, we can see your slides. Oh, oh okay. So my um, history is basically before my participation in the Tour of Duty with Dime and after my participation in the Tour of Duty with Dime. And basically the playbook and and the 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 work that we do that we did with Kate in the measure sprint team where I was totally outside of my comfort zone. I had to learn from my colleagues. I had to read a lot to understand measures, what they are speaking about, because basically in oncology and all the trials that we support as an MD or working in a CRO where we support many sponsors to develop their own drugs, uh, we are not used to see much digital measures link it to endpoints like we see in cardiology or neurology. So it was an exciting uh, trip and that allowed me also to connect with Jen, with, with, with Kate and present an abstract uh, at ASCO this year. And after that, it triggered a lot of questions linked to, okay, although I know what we measure in oncology clinical trials, I need to go back and try to understand myself if we are doing the measure or that we definitely need in terms of the impact of new drugs that we see and we use to treat patients. So basically what we measure is patient safety for sure for early trials. We use a criteria called CDK where it's basically to speak the same language and we allocate a grade to each advertisement to then define what we will do with that patient if we stop treatment with change treatment or not. And then those adverse events can be just plain adverse events with grade one to three or four or, or have those serious adverse events where the patient is hospitalized. When you have serious adverse events, it's for sure easier for the MD and for the medical team to measure what is going on with that adverse event. But when we have adverse events that happen at home and then we have those skip visits during the clinical trial with the patient and we have to discuss what happened and they have to tell us what they feel and then we have to try to allocate a number in terms of the grade of that event is where we, as Jorge said, we start to do not fully understand if what we are definitely deciding is what we should be doing. Uh, there are a lot of cultural differences in terms of patient, how they address their grade, and, and for sure, every MD will grade potentially the same adverse event in a different way. The other thing that we measure at early phase is just a secondary endpoint and more in phase three trials is efficacy. This is 100% objective. We are looking at the at scan, tumors, size. We follow that, that uh, lesions, across the whole history of the patient within the clinical trial and we finally put the numbers in slide and say okay this drug has that percentage in terms of uh, overall response some amount of month in terms of overall survival and progressive pre-survival is that enough yes easy enough to help uh, to understand the response from a tumor to a drug but I don't really know if this is enough without the whole evaluation and adding the clinical benefit of the uh, drug to those patients. We have drugs that are working really well with awesome numbers and then when we start to treat patients, we know and we understand that the quality of life is not what we expect. ECO, it's just to measure performance status. I will not go through that because Jorge did a great and awesome job. Uh, <clears throat> That is a big challenge. It's one of the key inclusion criteria for every clinical trial, and it happens a lot of time that 
that we see patients with ECO1, then they start to receive the drug and they have to drop the drug and be discontinued. And we really do not understand if, if, if it was the impact of the drug of that patient was definitely ECO1 at the entry of the clinical trial. That impacts in the way that we will modify try, um, uh, treatments, whole treatment, change treatment. So it's very important to come with more objective uh, measures. Quality of life, we, we uh, quality of life is measured in all oncology clinical trials, usually as exploratory endpoint. We use patient report outcome measures, PRO, EPRO. This is fully what is the patient feeling. So it's, it's data coming from them. We do not review that clinicians or anyone else. It can be remote that will allow us to have more ongoing uh, checks or just at sites. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> there is difficulties in, in terms of the kind of questionnaires that we use. And although for the traditional approval by the FDA is part of the three pillars that are benefit risk and providing the patient a better life, we see that pro-information is usually not included in the labels when drugs are approved. And we have two examples on the left side and one recent paper published uh, with a review in breast cancer drugs approved where basically none of the pro-information was included in the drug label. Basically, the FDA reviewers comment that the lack of meaningfulness, clinical significance, and lack of content validity it's basically the reason for that. But there was a time that quality of data had a kind of impact and was when shemcitabine was approved over 5-FU for patients with pancreatic cancer in the metastatic disease. You can see that part of the primary endpoint, uh, you have measures of pain, performance status, and weight. So although the difference in terms of overall survival that depends on many things was not uh, too much, the difference in terms of clinical benefit, it was almost 20%. So can digital measures with objectively data reinstate this quality of life as co-primary endpoint? I hope yes. I think that we have a lot of work to do. We have on the right side some, some quick uh, search that I did in our ASCO meeting library. We have five results when I loaded wettables from 2016 to now, and two particular trials that are, were very interested. One is a review of the past 10 years uh, in patients with lung cancer where they trying to test performance status and activity level using uh, wearable devices, and only 32 trials in 10 years. The outcomes and output were very, difficult, were very different, and the conclusions for sure were linked that patients with better uh, with better uh, activity that sleep better, they have a better outcome. The second one, and I was so happy to see that, is that for this trial that is ongoing, they sit down and they try to understand what the patients need. So uh, this sponsor went to the key opinion leaders, patient, patient advocacy partners, caregivers, patients and ask them, what do you need in terms of improvement of quality of life? So based on that, they decide which is in line with Playbook, the meaningful aspect of health, the concept of interest, and finally, they decide what kind of technology they will be using. So this is a nice trial that we should uh, be focused on. I hope that the outcomes will be great for sure that the, the, the endpoints are exploratory. In terms of technology, measures is part of connected devices and we are speaking about BCD and this is what is transforming the life of the patients, the life of the CROs, the life of the sponsors. We are looking for patient centricity and that involves a lot of things including data, data flow, which is complex because it's, it flies from devices, from televisits, from, from different kind of e-reports into a platform and that platform should flow into the ADC, which usually is very rigid and used to, to capture specific um, data. But I am happy to see that although we do not have too much ongoing 
hybrid or fully DCT trials presented at ASCO this year, I find out one of uh, that it's that it's ongoing, that it's captured the end-to-end -end solution that that also we as a CRO are trying to do, which is from the molecular to conduct local oncologies, enroll the patient under a DCT uh, way. It's obvious that not all the trials can be fully DCT, fully decentralized. But here you have a nice example that with oral drugs, you can definitely uh, think about something that it's, it's very important. In terms of data collection and PRO, they will be collecting also PRO-CDK, which is the patient report outcome based on the CDK grade. So they are um, putting a number to the adverse event that they are experiencing. We expect a lot of discrepancies, but at the end of the day, as I said before, PRO data, quality of life data, is just a complement of safety and to the efficacy data based on the lack maybe of objectivity. Here is the way that we have been thinking about that because you have the data, you have the connected devices, you have the DCT, you have whatever you want, but then what do we do with the data from the medical perspective? And that is key. That is key to move forward into the change, to move those digital measures and be sure that the data that we capture is meaningful for the patients. So finally, the biggest challenges uh, in terms of decentralized clinical trials and digital measures is for sure the early phase or complex designs where the hybrid approach will be more feasible. The mechanism of action of the drugs, not the same CAR-T trial that a, an oral trial. Um, develop measures that matters to the patient, rather to put the technology and see what happens. Quantity of data, regulatory acceptance, and for sure data protection and privacy. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to receive questions. Thanks, Ariel. I think you did a great job of setting the stage for our discussion that we have momentarily. But for the sake of time, I think, um, Ryan, I'm going to move on to the last poll question that we have before we start our discussion. Excellent. Sounds good. So this should be appearing on everyone's screen at this time. This question asks, what are the biggest challenges you face around the topic of digital innovation in oncology trials? Your answer options are considerations around patient burden, executive corporate buy-in and budgeting, no idea where to start, risk-averse culture, or lack of validated tools. I'll give everyone a few seconds to get an answer in. You can select from any of the answers you see in front of you and then click Submit. Looks like most of you have participated. Thank you very much. It is up on the screen with your results right now. Um, Without uh, further ado, I think we'll move into our Q&A session. Um, I'd like to invite the audience to continue sending any questions or comments that they have uh, with the questions window for the Q&A portion of the webinar. Uh, Jeremy and Kate, I believe we've already received some questions and you can get started when you're ready. Thanks, Ryan. Jeremy, you're on mute. Thanks, Kate. Really enjoyed the presentation, guys. Those, those are really great questions. And um, we had a few questions come in from the audience. And uh, so I, th this one here, I, I noticed says for, for, uh, for George says, have you looked at whether the scores from objective performance scores change how physicians make treatment decisions? I guess just a curious question there. Well, we really have not been providing the scores to physicians in real time. We were actually just this month awarded an SBIR grant to actually make the programming around that possible so that physicians would be able to, to get an immediate score and then see uh, what their decisions would, would be and whether they would be different. All right, thank, thanks, George. Kate, okay, you want to choose one? Yeah, sure. So I think I'm going to open the big can of worms and Ariel, you touched on this a little bit, but I mean, my question for the group is, well, my question and also somebody from the audience's question is, why do you think wearable adoption into oncology trials is low compared to other therapeutic areas? Does deploying wearables into cancer studies add complexity to the trial, increase patient burden and increase trial complexity? So I guess I'll um, throw that to you, George, first. Well, I think the big reason they haven't been incorporated is uh, the FDA used to be all about overall survival. And if it didn't improve overall survival, it didn't really matter. Uh, I think that's changed. I think the mood at the FDA is a little bit different now. I think disease-free survival has recently become an endpoint. 
And, and I think there's a bigger interest in things that have an impact on quality of life, particularly in supportive care indications, cachexia management, uh, and other aspects of, of care of, of medical patients. But, but what I, I think the, what people are, are missing the point in if they're thinking that it makes the trial complex. In a way, it may make the trial less complex uh, because the variability that you get when you have poor performance status people enrolled onto trials and what that does to the heterogeneity of the patient population uh, and how that impacts the toxicity scores and the explanation of those toxicity scores that come later on the line, um, I, I think those will become much simpler um, if, if people were actually to incorporate these measures. Yeah, and I think Heather, you can comment on this too, but I, I think that this work is being done in non-drug development clinical trials, right? So there's some level of infrastructure that has been developed by people and it may not be exactly in the space that we're trying to move these tools into now, but I think we can learn from others in, in different areas that may not be exactly um, where we're headed for this. So Heather, I'm, I'm curious for you and your team, have you come to a point where you feel like this is second nature? Maybe, maybe not second nature, but you know how to do this. You know how to operationalize these in clinical trials. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's it's an interesting question because I do think there's new openness to it. And particularly as survival gets longer, right? You can't have, it's no longer sort of overall survival is a difficult outcome to measure because then that means the trial has to go longer. Um, so I think that, you know, it there are lots of tools and it's, as as Jorge was saying, it's it's not hard to do. I think people, Get a little bit intimidated by it, um, but the quality and the quantity of the data is um, is really useful to have. Yeah, absolutely. Ariel, you talked a little bit about DCT in your in your slides there, and the fact that DCT, yeah. Yeah. Um, while you know in, in theory is 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 where we want to head, we we're really kind of in this hybrid space right now, right? So. You, know, you look at digital methods of measurement, where, where do you see like the most applicability and low hanging fruit, I guess, is it, for lack of a better term there? Or, you know, where, where do you see just the opportunity there? Do you see it specifically in general mobility measures that speak to quality of life or more specific functional measures that are done episodically? Or what's your perspective on digital measures in these DCTs? So, yes. I think that what Jorge is doing is key because um, most of the decisions that we do as physicians and, and when you go through a protocol, it's always, always linked to, to, to the performance status of the patient. And then in terms of the adverse event on, on the grades and because based on that, you take decisions and those decisions will impact definitely on the outcome of that drug. I understand that we cannot measure all, but, but we sh should definitely sit down and think about what are the key things that we should measure to complement the pro data and all the data that we collect. So at the time that we submit that, uh, they also have objective data. And in terms of DCT, we are definitely working a lot and patients are happy, are happy uh, because we are trying to, to, to have the whole structure for those patients to be care at home, uh, particularly for trials where they are open and they are comparing with the standard of care arms and they do not want to just drive one hour to receive the drug that they can receive five blocks away. Right. I feel like we're at this sort of in, in inflection point in, in, in the time, yes. right? It has been cat catalyzed through, of course, the pandemic, but also just changes it uh, or you mentioned at FDA around the use of these measures in, in studies and what I'm not hearing is is a lot of patient pushback I'm hearing a, a little bit of welcoming on that and so yes. uh, that's encouraging Kate yeah I mean I would absolutely agree and I think that um, this idea that adding these measures will add complexity to something that's already very complex yes it's going to be a process to build the infrastructure to do this and and to learn how, you know how to do it appropriately and develop these things um, from the ground up in a robust, rigor rigorous way. But I think at the end of the day, what we have at the other end of that is something that's much more efficient, much more patient-centric, and hopefully will improve patient outcomes at the end of the day. So, 
Yes. And it's at some point to bring back the clinical benefit, right? Because we are still uh, having patients that are doing really great in resist when you check their response of the tumor, but they are not doing well in terms of, of, of how they feel. So uh, yep. that is key and digital measures can help. I think we're out of time, but I would like to, the questions that remain. If if we uh, if, if we if, you, if the panelists wouldn't mind us passing us passing those along to you, uh, maybe to answer for the people that have these questions might be helpful. Yes, okay. well, um, if we couldn't attend to your questions, though, the speakers uh, may follow up with you after our presentation today. But of course, any of our attendees who have further questions can direct them to the email addresses that are up on the screen. I want to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving an email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. And I'm about to send you a link in the chat box. And with this link, you'll be able to view the recording of this event on this page. And you can also share this link with your colleagues when they register for the recording here as well. So I encourage you to do that. Now, please join me in thanking all of our speakers for their time here today. We hope that you all found the webinar informative. Have a great day, everyone, and thanks for coming. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.